Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, Iranian top nuclear scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh is laid to rest. Gyms and pools try to get in on the reopening action. And in spite of rising rates of coronavirus worldwide, Israeli athletes are still competing, kicking butt and taking names. Starting with our top story tonight, Iranian nuclear program head and scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh laid to rest today. A massive funeral procession in Tehran on Monday, the Ayatollah regime laying to rest the country's top nuclear weapon scientist and program leader following his shocking assassination on Friday, an act widely condemned in the international community, including now by the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, and several Western countries. And Iranian leadership is still pointing the finger at the United States and Israel. Officials even circulating alleged photos of the suspects, claiming the murder weapon bears the logo and specifications of the Israeli military, while vowing harsh retaliation for the strike. The Iranian defense minister then going on to point out the apparent hypocrisy in the West's opposition to a nuclear Iran. But while finger-pointing and threatening, several varying reports of how the incident went down is somewhat drawing the validity of all these claims into question. Initial reports alleging a vehicle exploding and causing a block in the road in front of the convoy carrying Fakhrizadeh. This followed by a hail of high-powered gunfire, leaving Fakhrizadeh and his government bodyguards dead at the scene. In telling the story, the New York Times even quotes a source as saying that the scene was like something out of a Hollywood movie, with up to 12 assassins entering the scene in an instant and exiting unharmed just as quickly. But according to the latest claims in Iranian media, which all come from a single unnamed source, the attack was carried out using an Israeli-manufactured weapon controlled by satellite, or maybe a remote-controlled turret, with no live agents involved in the operation at all. Whatever the case, the brazen attack follows several other similar operations over the past few years, seemingly designed to torment Iran by flexing muscles and exposing flaws in their security. Prime Minister Netanyahu, for one, even calling out Mr. Fakhrizadeh by name in 2018, after exposing a massive Iranian nuclear documents archive. So Iran devised a plan to do two things. First, to preserve the nuclear know-how, from Project Ahmad, and second, to further develop its nuclear weapons-related capabilities. That plan came directly from Iran's top leadership. A key part of the plan was to form new organizations to continue the work. This is how Dr. Mohsen Fakhizadeh, head of Project Ahmad, put it. Remember that name, Fakhizadeh. And today, in 2010, or 2018, this work is carried out by Sapand. That's an organization inside Iran's Defense Ministry. And you will not be surprised to hear that Sapand is led by the same person who led Project Ahmad, Dr. Fahri Zadeh, and also, not coincidentally, many of Sapand's key personnel worked under Fahri Zadeh on Project Ahmad. Well, here now to help break down this Fakhri Zadeh assassination and what it might mean for the region is research fellow, fellow at the International Institute for Counterterrorism at IDC Herzliya, Dr. Fadi Esmail. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. All right, so, you know, let's start with the changing narratives, all right, because we've heard a couple of different stories with respect to how the assassination was carried out. How, how do you believe it went down? First of all, I would say, tell everyone, don't believe, and don't believe anything. We will not know this until decades from now, because uh, that's what happens usually in those situations. Even decades later, as we know, uh, if you remember the movie uh, Munich that uh, Steven Spielberg did, 
And we thought that he got everything right because it was 50 years later. Uh, we discovered that many of the assassination attempts were not uh, the scenes, were simply incorrect. It didn't happen that way. So we will not know the details until a very long time into the future. I can tell you we had previous assassinations. We had Osama bin Laden. We had Soleimani. We had uh, Mughniye. We had, and we thought we knew what went on there. So I want to tell everybody, you know, cool your, your engines. Uh, yeah, I, I do hear the different stories. One thing I can tell for sure, I mean, it seems like a very large operation. Uh, Mr. Fakhri Zadeh, we know him for years, even uh, since the late 1990s. He is a very, he's a general, Fakhri Zadeh. Since he was a lieutenant colonel or something like that, he was already um, uh, paid attention to by uh, Western um, uh, services. Uh, re reaching him or, get, or getting to him would have been a very difficult, a very, very difficult operation that probably involved dozens of people. And I would assume that what happened there, again, I don't know, I assume that all of a sudden uh, a very narrow window opened up because the man was off every possible uh, uh, network yeah, or matrix. They said, they said it was a circuitous route that was changing regularly. Yeah, he didn't, use, he didn't use credit cards, he didn't use cell phones, he didn't use, I mean, the guy was off, off the net. He was yeah. nowhere, you know, and so somebody caught something and he went for it. Well, okay, so, you know, what evidence then, because you're telling us that, again, we, we can't take anything without a very large grain of salt. A very large one, yeah. So, you know, how much stock do we put into the, into the allegations that Israel is either involved or even orchestrating this attack? Look, I would believe that the Mossad in some way was involved, maybe other agencies, mm -hmm. who knows, maybe it was CIA, I don't know, you can, we don't really know. Don't know. And it could be, an, uh, I'm not going to lie, many people pretend that they do, I tell you, if you weren't there, if you weren't part of the team, you don't really know. And I'm not going to pretend that I do, but the, the way it was done is reminiscent of previous uh, operations that ended up being um, um, attributed either to Mossad or to the CIA. And um, I tend to think it was Israel mm -hmm. with uh, the help of local opposition uh, groups, uh, maybe uh, locals for sure. Uh, the Iranians are trying to say it was Mujahideen Khal. Maybe yes, maybe yeah. not. Uh, but this is not a simple operation. It means you had many people, many sentinels. This is an operation that uses many sentinels on the, on the road. It uses a lot of cyber work. Um, it uses uh, a, lot of a lot of logistics. Uh, probably satellites, stuff like that, like movie, uh, literally like the movies. Because again, because of the type of the person, how secretive he is, was, and uh, the kind of, uh, the whole system that was around him. So, uh, you know, I, one of my final questions, I get, you know, how important, and we've heard from a couple different people try to sum this up quickly, but how important was Fakhri Zadeh to the Iranian nuclear program? How, how far back is the program set back by his death? The question is, it depends on how, does he have a good replacement or not? I mean, he has been long enough on the scene maybe to create a second, uh, uh, to, to raise another generation. He was not merely, some people call him a scientist. Yes, he was a scientist, he was a professor of physics, but he was also a major general in the uh, Revolutionary Guard. So this is, he's not only the guy who knows how a bomb works. This is he's a also, he's a, kind of he's, he's a, strate a strategist. He's some kind of a Qasem Soleimani. Do they have somebody like him underneath him? Uh, we know the names of the people that they have, or some of them. Is any, uh, we know after Soleimani, uh, Qa'ini did not yet, still yet to prove himself at that issues. stature. We don't know what's happening on the physics side of it. Maybe, I don't know, I hope not. <laughs> All right, well, Dr. Fadi Esme, thank you so much for giving us some. Thank you time. for having me. Moving on, warnings of a return to closures be damned. More and more Israelis are demanding the right to go back to work in spite of spikes in coronavirus infections. Nittany Manson reporting. Schools are back. Okay, some so museums much, are back. Malls and marketplaces are back. And now gyms and swimming pools are demanding to get in on the action in green and yellow cities. This in accordance with the outlines that's currently gaining support in the Knesset. The Israeli Gym Forum saying in a press release that all the professional bodies understand that the gym industry is essential and are in favor of opening under health ministry regulations. But Israeli authorities are rejecting the idea of opening further as infections continue to rise again. <laughs>
אני מבקש מהאזרחים להמשיך לשמור על הכללים ולהישמע להוראות משרד הבריאות. And Health Minister Yuli Edelstein similarly threatening to close the country back down after massive crowds flooded into malls over Black Friday weekend. Meanwhile, following an outbreak among employees at a Dead Sea hotel, new health ministry reports also alleging that at least two out of three of Israelis returning from abroad have been breaking quarantine, and at least one to two percent of those same returnees coming back infected. But since quarantine is no longer mandatory for entry into Israel, Edelstein is suggesting that stricter measures be reinstated. Finally, as for the infection rate itself, hovering at nearly 4% on Sunday, the number of active infections has again risen above 10,000, and the death toll now reaching 2,864. <laughs> החפה של המצב שיכול להביא אותנו למחוזות קשים בהרבה, אפילו יותר קשים ממה שספגנו עד עכשיו. In other coronavirus news, as the country waits for a vaccine to arrive, some of Israel's most financially impacted are also desperately waiting for the aid that's been promised to them. Well, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is now unveiling an interesting and new comprehensive plan to support the domestic Israeli economy and keep the cost of living as low as possible. ודווקא בעת הזאת עלינו לחזק את התעשייה הישראלית ולרכוש מוצרים ישראלים. אני קורא גם לאזרחי ישראל לרכוש תוצרת המדינה, כן, תוצרת כחול לבן, כדי לעודד את התוצרת המקומית ובכך לחזק את העסקים. Now the basic goal of the proposal is to encourage the purchase of domestic products and it does so in five main ways. First by providing preference for domestic products in mixed tenders for goods and services. Second, by providing preference for domestic products in local authorities via allowing comparisons with the lowest bid. Third, by looking into getting domestic preference for business tenders that include Israeli and secondary suppliers. Fourth, by launching a public campaign to encourage the purchase of domestic products. And finally, fifth, by aiding small to mid-sized businesses in expanding online. <laughs> וגם מהמשרדים הנוגעים בדבר, לסייע סיוע מיוחד לאי-קומרס ישראלי לעסקים קטנים. כלומר, כשהם יוכלו, הגדולים עושים את זה בלאו הכי, אבל הקטנים, העסקים הקטנים, ואולי הבינוניים, אני רוצה שהם יוכלו למכור את הסחורה שלהם, תוצרת הארץ, דרך האינטרנט באי-קומרס, ואני מבקש לעבות את האמצעי הקיים, כי יש אתר באינטרנט, אני רוצה לעבות אותו, ואני רוצה... לוודא שאנחנו מעבירים אליו תקציבים שכבר הוקצו לכך את הכסף הדרוש למאמץ חשוב זה. Now speaking of financial solutions, the finance ministry is finally set to unveil its $128 billion budget plan for 2021. And none too soon as Attorney General Mandelbit is demanding that it be submitted in time for Knesset approval. Well, joining me to discuss it is ILTV consumer behavior expert, Dr. Vili Abraham. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Now, what do you make of this new budget plan? It's got 15 billion shekels uh, more than what was approved or unapproved for 2020. Zero tax increases, no budget cuts for any government ministries at, at this time at least, and 50 some odd reforms in the areas of, of financial competition, innovation, investments, uh, infrastructure, pro training, and, and, and more. So it's really surprising that uh, the government is not forced to uh, uh, make any budget cuts. Um, the budget is, 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 is really big. As you said, it's bigger than the one that we had last year. Um, and I think one of the more interesting things is that the government um, thinks that it doesn't have to uh, cut the budget because there are expectations for economic growth. If we look at projections for next year, the economy is expected to increase somewhere between four and a half and five percent, which is excellent. Uh, and that's as opposed to this year, which it, you know, when it shrank drop, by yeah. seven percent. Yeah, so um, we're talking about uh, a budget that includes uh, reforms, about 50 different re uh, reforms in four fields. We're talking about competition uh, in the financial sector, which I think is great. It means that we'll have maybe more banks competing uh, for the Israeli uh, consumer, uh, maybe more companies that will be issuing uh, credit cards, innovation investment in the high-tech infrastructure, which is great. We're also talking about deployment of optical fibers. 
we're a bit behind in comparison to other countries as far as the speed of the internet is concerned. Well, and you're talking about and all I, the way out to the periphery as well, yeah? Yes, we're talking about the periphery. And because we're one of the leading countries as far as autonomous vehicle technology development is concerned, we've got to have the best, highest, uh, quickest internet available. Otherwise, we won't be able to continue to be you know, at the forefront of the technology. Training of about 100,000 different um, employees and I guess the training will focus on uh, digital marketing uh, because that's where there are more jobs currently. And also reforms as far as import regulation is concerned. And I think this is great because we just heard Benjamin Netanyahu say that he wants to increase uh, competition in Israel. He wants Israelis to buy more domestic products. Absolutely. If you want to do that, you have to increase competition because now as far as uh, you know, uh, ordering online and getting things delivered quickly, we're really far behind the United States, so we gotta, you know, we gotta push there a little bit. Well, so, so my final question, real quick, you know, do you think that we have a chance of passing it? Well, I think we we do. There are a lot of uh, efforts to do so, and it has to be approved by the twenty third of December. Otherwise, Parliament will be automatically dissolved. So, I think all efforts are being made by the finance ministry and different parties to get this through. Otherwise, we'll be we'll find ourselves in the fourth election. And that's something nobody wants because that's yeah. in itself very expensive. Of course, Absolutely. millions of shekels. All right. Well, Dr. Vili Abraham, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right. Now, while the government debates the potential 2021 budget, Israel is currently looking for other ways to make some money through talks with Canada's top ACES defense training contractor. The Israeli Ministry of Defense is now negotiating the sale of 29 surplus F-16 fighter jets to the tune of three to four million dollars apiece. The General Dynamics F-16 Falcon jets were delivered to Israel in the early 1980s and have been slowly phased out of the IAF as newer model aircrafts joined the fray. But now they'll still get some mileage serving the Canadian and German Air Forces through the private Top Aces contractor. This as Top Aces offers training services to Air Forces worldwide. And turning for a moment to the United States, President Donald Trump's administration may be down, but it's certainly not out. White House advisor and president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, now set to make at least one more last-ditch effort towards peace in the Middle East. Hannah Rifkin with the details. Still rejecting the election results and vowing to keep up the fight, United States President Donald Trump was seen returning to the White House with his family Sunday. And this following meetings with senior Republicans who told him that his election fight is unlikely to be successful. But just as he's eyeing another hopeful victory at home, reports show that White House advisor Jared Kushner will be traveling again to Saudi Arabia this week in efforts to broker one more Israel normalization deal. Kushner will be meeting with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in Naom, the same Red Sea city where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo held their summit. Still, Saudi officials maintain that they will wait for a negotiated settlement with the Palestinians before normalizing with Israel, a status quo position that Saudi Arabia has held for years. Additionally, Saudi Arabia reportedly pulled back from any chance of a deal as soon as Joe Biden was nominated president-elect. It's thought that the kingdom wants to build ties with the incoming administration by cementing ties under Biden's White House instead. Now, in other news, Israelis took top honors in recent international competitions, including a gold and two silvers for windsurfing, a gold each for rhythmic and artistic gymnastics, and a qualifying victory over Spain in European basketball. Joining us with more on this exciting news is head of the sports department at Israel's Khan broadcaster, Yoav Borowitz. Yoav, thank you so much for being with us. Now, what are your initial reactions to, to all these wins? First of all, Aaron, I am very happy, and I think a lot of Israelis are very happy because we're not so used to having, you know, great achievements in sports. Right. But let's start, with, let's start with Linoy Ashram, who really did something outstanding by winning the gold in the European Championship and artistic and rhythmic gymnastics. Mm -hmm. This is just an unbelievable achievement because when you look at the Olympics, you know, we also have, you know, very good achievements in judo, and in windsurfing, but with all due respect to those sports, the, the ratings, you know, and in the Olympics, not a lot of people watch those sports, but many, many millions around the world are watching gymnastics and rhythmic and artistic gymnastics, just like they watch 
track and field and swimming, those are the big time uh, sporting events in the Olympics. So having a gold in the European Championship in rhythmic gymnastics is just something that is almost unbelievable. So yeah. Linoy Ashram now is a great hope for a, for a gold medal, definitely a medal in the Olympic Games in Tokyo. But, as, but let's not forget, you have Cohen from the windsurfing who won the gold in the European Championship in Portugal, while Shachar Tuberi is winning the silver and Keti Spichakov is winning the silver in the women's. All of them are hopefuls for uh, medals in Tokyo. And also what we had recently in uh, judo with Peter Polchik, uh, up to 100 kilograms winning the gold in European championship. And as you mentioned, Aaron, the Israeli basketball national team beating Spain in Spain. So really, we, are, we don't know how we became you know, so, so lucky and so fortunate to be talking about all those achievements. Well, and so, and you really bring me over to my next question. You know, what is the future really for these athletes? Because you mentioned, of course, the Tokyo Olympics, which have been delayed to this coming summer. Uh, you know, what, what other championships or competitions should we be looking forward to? And not just really from these competitions that, uh, you know, where Israelis took top honors over the last week or so, but really in general. First of all, all of those athletes will have more competitions before the Olympics. One of them is very important the 2021 European Championship in windsurfing, which will decide who will represent Israel in the Olympic Games, wh whether it will be Yoav Cohen, the youngster, the 21-year-old who just won gold now, or it will be Shachar Tsuberi, the, the great veteran, 34-year-old, who won uh, already an Olympic medal in Beijing 2008. So this is mm -hmm. going to be very exciting. Obviously, with Linoy Ashram, there are going to be you know, another big, big competition for her. It's very, very difficult to win a medal in artistic and uh, rhythmic mm -hmm. gymnastics. But also, if you're looking at the basketball team tonight, there is a game against Poland. We're talking qualifiers for the Eurobasket, the European Championships. Now, this team will finally want to make it to the World Championships, an achievement that is the Israeli basketball team could not achieve since the 1980s. Now we also have our soccer team that might have a new coach and will try to make it to the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, which will be the greatest um, achievement and the greatest uh, sporting event besides wow. the Olympics. So there's still, you know, a lot of tests and, right. you know, exciting um, events to, to come and to look forward to. All right. Well, we hope that obviously the coronavirus is not going to affect any of these events any more than it already has. Yoav, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy with lows around 51 degrees Fahrenheit or 11 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow should be partly cloudy again. Highs dropping to an average of 70 Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius. And now before we go, of course, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Ha! <laughs> well, it does look delicious. I don't blame them. That's, <laughs> that is, I don't know, is that like a cruel costume to put the dog in? <laughs> Considering that this larger dog is clearly very hungry for it. Oh, God. I can't. I can't. That is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.32 shekels to the American dollar and 2.55 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.